stay in VR and I mean, oops, so now, so now we have all these portable VR screens, I mean, which not just allow us to watch interactive 2D content, but we are also able to watch full six degree of freedom. And this is very new to us because uh, it provides us a possibility of being first, for the first time, uh, to be really inside of a story and to experience the story uh, being part of it. And creating a movie, for example, out of a book is a progress or process with a lot of translation. I mean, we have a very defined way of which f f frames per seconds we choose, which colors, which lights, camera angles, and which framing, and they are all, all related to what kind of emotions we want to trigger in the audience. And also, it, it's like a bi-directional thing, because the audience has learned how to read those rules. And uh, this is something which needs to accomplish over a longer period of time. In VR, I mean, the viewer can walk around and decide on his own which parts he wants to focus on. And so the camera is basically the viewer. And rules from film or games can't be really applied directly to VR. So the whole story telling a part has to be rewritten from you. Just, just as one example, imagine if you have a low angle camera in the cinema. Um, I mean, this will make the uh, actor more dominant for the audience. But if you have a low angle uh, camera like in VR, where you basically shrink the viewer, the world uh, for him would feel like as if he's a child, or even if you make it more extreme, as if he would be a bug. So the same adjustment triggers two completely different emotional states in the viewer. And this is quite impressive. So let us quickly drive dive into the uh, world of content creation. So um, for this, I think it's important to understand that technology always drives the way how we consume content. I mean, if you look at the first TVs, it took quite a while un until they actually got to a stage where more people adopted to it. So um, same as TVs change the content perception, uh, the, the creation of new head mount displays change our perception as well. And that's why important in the, in the later talks today in this uh, sessions, uh, we have also hardware, uh, hardware producers who explain more about their technology there, because it's important to not just look at the content and the creation of content, but also what kind of technology implications this has, what, how can you distribute the content and uh, how will your audience perceive it. At the moment, um, regarding the last research I read was, that in the US at least about 8% of the households now owning a VR headset. And just to bring this into perspective, this means we are like in the 50s of TV consumption because in the 50s, the household had about like 8% uh, of TVs in the US. And uh, it took them about 15 years to get from those 8% to 90% of households with a TV. So it wasn't such a long uh, time period, but nowadays it's very faster because um, uh, things are scaling up mu much more quicker than it was in, in those early days. But uh, wh what I see is that we still have a bit of time where this technology will evolve and we are far away from, uh, I mean, things for TV like having uh, Dolby surround and very colorful images and all those things, those will happen uh, onto those devices as well. So it's very, very, it's a beginning. And if you look at the content creation side, I like to compare it a bit with, with uh, when we look how original content was created in the early days. I mean, in the beginning, we just had the way to do manual work, and this was very stylized by painting those art pieces. And then uh, technology provided us a possibility to take a real picture of something. And uh, this picture is a static representation of the reality. And after this, we, we managed, due to technology, to make it movable until we evolved the cinematic experience we're all familiar with now. And when you look at 3D content in comparison, right now we have the same steps. So we have the manual work of stylized characters or stylized environments, which will be created right now. And this is something which still most of the uh, yeah, content creators use or got used to. Then now we got more and more, I would say, AAA productions who are going over and using scanning systems. I mean, those scanning systems are all also already on the market, I think, like 20 years. And I mean, you, maybe you're already familiar with them because you could do scans with you in shopping malls to today and get a 3D print of yourself. Those are like systems. And if you combine those and do like hundreds of scans with some emotions, you can start blending between them. But the big problem or the big challenge with those systems is actually that it's very complex to create then those animation based back onto the scan characters. So it's a very intensive pipeline. And if you really look into it, I mean, if you're aiming for AAA game content to make those persons more realistic, 
it's something which gets very, very expensive, very fast, and it's not really affordable for any, I would say, creative content producers. So nowadays, um, regarding the last years, uh, we managed to have a new technology on the market called volumetric capture or volume cap, where you're basically not just doing a static scan of a person uh, itself, but you are able to really scan the person with whole movement and motion. And uh, this provides a much more fidelity look of those characters. And you can imagine uh, scanning environments and bringing them together, it's a pretty huge benefit. But I have to quickly, I think, jump through to not lose too much time because it's just like 15 minutes I have. So the process of this is quite easy. You can uh, nowadays use it like a normal camera and then you have a 3D object, uh, just a quick glimpse into it. Uh, I think it will, video presentation due to crank will a bit laggy, but uh, I think you get a glimpse of the studio, how this looks. And here you also see that you need a lot of hardware actually to achieve something which is then very useful and very, very convenient to, to produce content. But uh, you often need a lot of technology in the end. And then uh, this is actually one of the captures of myself. Uh, on our website, you will see more of those examples. But you see those uh, captures are don't look like uh, avatar anymore. You, you see it's a real person. And um, if Rybella would allow it or would be possible, maybe in the next social VR things, I, I could present myself like this on the stage here. And just to give you a brief glimpse of possibilities, uh, because once people have been scanned in this manner, you can't just use them for uh, VR content, but uh, you can also use them for mixed reality content, uh, for augmented reality content. And this is a, the big thing. If you create your content volumetrically, that you have everything scanned in 3D, you are basically completely free for up, uh, upcoming devices on the market. So here you see just one example where uh, the band was then live uh, integrated into environment and then people could uh, do show performance with them. Here's another quick example of another famous band from Germany we have captured. And here, this wasn't actually a part of the real project, but just a, a little a uh, little piece of it uh, from a loop from those four, four persons. And we tried to figure out or think about what, what can we do with this little loop. It's, it was an additional capture. And so we created like a massive scene. Let me pause this video here so you can get at least a glimpse of it. So this is just the whole band as an same as an audience dancing to the same song. And if you would hear the music and so it's quite funny actually. And um, as you as you can imagine, if you have a VR headset on you and you could walk around those environments, the storytelling uh, is affected quite drastically by how to tell stories in this direction and also uh, what you do with those persons. And I mean, in the beginning, a lot of people ask us about, okay, can you do interactive things like having uh, the person, for example, look in your face that you get a more personal direction. So when the person with the headset walks around you, and this is possible, but now, now since it is possible, we see that you have to direct those things as well. Because if you imagine you have a stage like this with hundreds of people and you walk there and everyone is looking at you, it doesn't, it might not trigger the attention or the emotions you want to have in the audience when they was when they want to experience something. Here's another just quick example I want to share with you in terms of content production, uh, because this is quite, or this was quite. Uh, yeah, it surprised me because uh, we, we have a quite big news channel in Germany called uh, Tagesschau. It's the biggest one uh, from the state and um, they're not very, uh, I would say, famous for providing emotional content. It's like very objective uh, time kind of news story. And we put it on the iPad and so people could experience this on, on the uh, IFA last year. And we had like 700 people uh, watching it and I was very impressed by how people really reacted to it. Like 80% of the people were totally blown away and they really watched the whole six minutes from start to end. So um, they got totally yeah, impressed by it because they could relate to the show and it was running from the weather channel to, to the normal things and you could really walk around the weather maps and everything. And when it was raining, it was raining around you and people got really amazed by it. And of course, um, the content production itself is not just related to uh, VR. So you, you can also use those things for creating uh, cinema content. I mean, if you have full uh, 3D virtual environments, you can use them for commercials, you can use them for feature films. So it's a very flexible way. And I think this is something what will change content production in the future quite drastically. And as I mentioned before, I mean, you also can imagine, I mean, this is just an, a quick example of a uh, Kurt we have scanned in Berlin. Um, I don't know if you can see it here, but I'd let me pause, let me pause this thing, but or let me just explain it. You can basically even read the little stickers on the pole. So you have much more feedback loops uh, with the client to really figure out uh, what people 
are possible. I mean, people could walk behind the poll and read what's written on there, and you have really to do feedback loops with the client that there's nothing actually in the scene which could uh, be disturbing for any viewers or something like this, because in, in Berlin especially, we have a lot of crazy graffiti and uh, text there. Um, but it's it's quite impressive because so you have you can kept, keep the whole whole authenticity of the whole environment and with new devices I think this will be a big step into the future um, how we receive and how we will produce content. I think um, I'm quite much done with my presentation right now, so let me switch back to Vibella. Thank you uh, very much for your attention. I don't know if you have time for a few questions. It would be uh, great if you could raise your hands. <laughs> We have like a time for one short question. If you if you have it, uh, you will see the raise hand button, which is in the bottom side of the middle of your screen. If you press it, I will see that you have a question. I will call out your name and then you can ask it. Don't be shy. Okay, there's a question. Uh... Rick. Rick. So sorry yes. for best pronouncing. <laughs> yeah, please, what is your question? Hi, um, I just have a question around the optimization. So if building this for social VR platforms, obviously the polygon, polygon count has to be really low. Is that handled within the software or do you have to do additional optimization after the scans? I mean, right, right now I would say um, those technology like volumetric capture is very new and um, I would, I would uh, I mean, current devices would not be able to uh, play back like hundreds or thousands of people in real time with this technology. But you can imagine if you have like a rock star on a, on a trade show and at least the visitors are participating as kind of avatars. Uh, this is something which, which is possible right now. Um, but bringing this technology to, let's say, I would say everyone will take a bit of time also for the capturing because no one wants to have those big stages at home to do a capture of themselves. But uh, this te the technology is evolving very fast. Thanks very much. Okay, then uh, thank you very much for your participation and I will uh, clear the stage for the next presentation. Thank you very much. Perfect then. It's the first question in a virtual conference is can you hear me? But it's a very nice experience to be standing here on stage and I'm here. Tell your presenter this number. Okay, wait, give me a second. I'm going to fix this. Um. If you're, uh, if you're, when you're sharing with Crankwell, you have to copy the first link and not the second link. Yeah, I'm there. I just yeah, auto accepted, so that should work. If those in the audience, if you do not see the screen or you have an error, please just press on the refresh button, which is on the top right corner of the middle screen. All right, this looks good. Welcome, everybody. Um, thanks for having me on stage here. Like I said, uh, this is a very special a very special thing uh, to be standing on a virtual stage. Um, as some of you might see, I am actually using virtual reality to present in virtual reality. Um, and the reason for that is that our company is called Eden and we are literally creating some amazing stuff with technology. We're in a way, we're a hacker, a hacker company. And uh, as a little bit of a of an example for that, um, here's the, the the tools I'm using. So un unfortunately, Verbella doesn't have um, any presentation tools in, in VR, but I wanted to make sure to have at least a little bit of expressions, uh, expressions here on stage and also show you that VR is the future, even though it needs a little bit of hard work like this. There's a little bit of problems with VR in, in these um, environments. And this is Eden. Um, we're a company from South Africa. There's uh, 12 people. And I joined late last year, and um, my role there is the head of Europe for for the company. And I'm also a co-founder of one of the largest communities on the internet for virtual reality. I'm a huge VR enthusiast. Um, for anyone of you who's on reddit.com, you might know the Oculus subreddit. Um, I'm one of the original founders of that. And some of you might know me from my former role at NVIDIA, where I was responsible for the European virtual reality business as their head of VR for EMEA. -E. And what the company does is we're, we're from South Africa, so our, our heart beats um, the African way, and we're from a, a city called Johannesburg that many of you obviously know. And what we've been doing there is uh, immersive tech shows. 
So shows where we brought in traditional artists and we enriched their art, we created content that, that allowed those viewers to view the experience through the eyes of the artist. And through that, we unfortunately, as content creators, we had to jump through a lot of hoops to make these things work. We realized that there's a ton of problems with virtual reality and um, with the current VR solutions. And the first one is that irks me really is the tech field scary. You always have to bring people a little bit closer to it. You have to explain it. And also it ruins your look. So for those of you who are sitting on Verbella, your look is not Im impacted at all. But for me, I had a full day of the investor uh, event at XR base that was done in Engage in full VR and my hair looked really mess messy. And this is obviously something that you don't really want as a first experience with your uh, with the new technologies that it ruins your look you're uh, you're really um anxious about what you look like to the uh, to the outside world explain explaining vr controls is really a nightmare so if you've ever done anything like this where you put somebody's finger onto a touchpad you know exactly what i'm talking about it's just a lot of friction getting people into vr there's a constant need for charging those those devices, if they're if they're mobile devices, they're literally almost always empty. And for some of for some of you who've seen this uh, part of this talk at uh, VR days last year, this is a little bit of a recap. And then I'll um, I'll I'll forward I'll go forward to a little bit more of a um, current state and where we are. There's Dominic, also no good I think way. I lost your voice. Did you? Uh, my mic is on. Hello, hello. My mic is on. Okay, can, most yeah. people, everybody can hear us. Okay, so look, Miller, it seems to be something on your side, but thanks for the, um, thanks for letting me know. All right, I'll go back one slide. Like I said, there's no good way to, to store VR devices. So many of you have seen this at real world events where you come into a room and there's a table with just a bunch of Oculus Go's flying around. You don't really know what to do. You don't really know um, how to use the device. It's really not the nicest experience, especially from a brand perspective. If you have a, a really nice show and you put a lot of effort into your booth, you don't want to, to have these VR devices just lying around like this. Another one is that VR demos almost always need hosts. So in the, in the real Laval Virtual, um, we would have seen a lot of hosts being there just to get people into VR and to explain all of these things that I just, um, that I just mentioned. There's uh, the problem that managing multiple devices is also a big mess. So if you do content updates or if you do firmware updates across multiple devices, and this is really not something that a content creator wants to do. They just want a display device that works. And also there's no insight in, into the device usage and health. So you don't really know um, how many people have viewed your device, which part of the content did they like best. Those are all things that, um, that you really don't really get from uh, p uh, devices like the Oculus Go or other devices where it's literally just a black box. You don't really know how many people have viewed your content and especially what part of content they found most engaging. And all of these problems we've solved over and over again in different, in different projects until we realize that it actually doesn't make sense to, to, to solve these problems over and over and over again. And everybody in the VR industry does that. And so we've created a device that is called Eden Snacker. And I wish I could show you the video here, but for reasons of uh, connectivity, I can't. Um, but I'll talk you through. This is Eden Snacker. And we've made this device with a patented grip. And that is really a game changer when it comes to the consumption of VR, because people don't have to strap into headsets. They don't need to learn any complicated controls. They literally just pick up the headset and hold it to their face, which is as easy as it gets. The system allows that way to really dive in and dive out of VR experiences quickly and get a quick glimpse into VR without all of the problems that I just mentioned. The headset itself docks onto a cradle and the cradle is equipped with wireless charging. So you don't ever need to uh, plug a cable into your devices to recharge them. They get automatically charged as soon as they rest on the cradle, which is very useful for events where you have a long way where, where you need to run for like eight hours. This would be impossible with other headsets where you have to have two sets of devices to make sure that the battery keep, keeps up with the demand. 
Another thing that we've implemented is a, is a, is a touch screen control. So essentially, instead of trying to figure out what to do with the VR controls and which button to press, you have a, an interface that everybody, you, uh, everybody knows how to use. And that way, you pick some, some content on, um, on the display, on the touch screen, and then as soon as you hold the headset to your face, it'll automatically play. We've also built a self-service kiosk version. Essentially, if, if there's a space where you don't want to guide somebody through an experience, you actually have a full kiosk that, that runs everything automatically. And there's a rating screen, there's a play button, it's all very much self-explanatory. There's no technical, um, there's no technical um, affinity from your viewer to be able to view this. And at the end, they can rate the experience, which also, again, feeds you back um, data on how people are using your device. And to make sure that these devices are always stay connected, you know, that you don't run into um, issues with your uh, event Wi-Fi or other problems, these, uh, these devices always have connectivity through 4G and in the future 5G. But you can also connect them to wired internet or Wi-Fi if you want more, if, if you want higher um, bandwidth there. And this allows you to get powerful insights on how those devices are being used literally all the time. Um, this, is, this is really important for you to be able to go back to your customers and say, okay, we did this nice VR activity. Here's what we got from it. We had 10,000 views. We had 4,000 minutes of, of uh, content. People uh, in this location experienced more content than in this location, and they've been higher engaged. And that, again, will give you insight on how you can change your approach in that regard. So like I said, Eden Platform solves all these problems, and Eden Snacker is the first product that taps into the features of the platform. And this is how we, this is, this is how we envision um, making VR easier in places like, for example, VR cinemas, where you, where you just have a bunch of snackers there. It's really easy. There's no need to explain anything, and it can be controlled through one central touch screen from an admin, for example. And this is how we ended our talk at VR Days 2020 with coming 2020. And I'm actually, we, we actually debated a lot um, in, in, in our team on whether to put a quarter here or like, you know, a, a H1 or a H2. And I'm, I'm the marketing person in our, in our company. I'm kind of happy that we didn't do that because, well, 2020 came. And many of you will have seen this picture. It's an, it's an image of China and the air pollution that they have. And since we are producing in China, this was obviously quite a shock for us because we at first had the issue that, well, the, the factory of the world has essentially shut down for a couple of weeks. And that is, that is something that obviously made us think and that many of you out there obviously also had to think about. How do you react? How, what do you do as a startup when there comes a, a sudden shift in, um, well, in the whole world essentially? And what we did is, first of all, we regrouped. I mean, many of you also know this image. We literally took our work from an analog way to a digital way. We're meeting every, every day. We, 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 we were able to continue our work seamlessly through the means of modern communication technology. And then we refine. We realize that there's a little bit of time that, that we can actually use to make a better product. So we had the chance to go back to some of our some of our initial ideas from the drawing boards, and one of the things that that I think turned out really cool is that we're 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 um, planning to include um, a NFC reader into the device. So there's there's going to be an NFC tag in the in the headset itself, and also one in the cradle and in the kiosk. And the NFC tag connects the two devices. So there's no, even for an admin, you don't have to go through crazy screens and look for serial numbers. You literally just tap the device and it'll automatically sync that way. But the NFC tag will also be in the front of the, of the kiosk. So whenever you want to have your customers engaged more or you want to collect um, uh, contact details from them. They can literally just tap their phone and that way you have a way of interacting with them without, without them having to go through forms and menus and, and all of that stuff. Another thing we refined is, and this, this is, just, sorry, this is just what I said, is we also put the NFC tech within the cradle. So the system also always knows when the, when the headsets are on the stand. 
which is obviously helpful for a, a remote device management. And we also, in, um, we also listen to the feedback from our customers. So one of the things we build in is um, a, a tether, um, a method to tether the headset for anti-theft reasons, for example, or if you for, for any reason want to tether the device to have a constant power input. Um, for example, in a, in a VR cinema where there would be more viewing time than resting time on the cradle. And another thing um, we've refined, and this takes a little while to load, It doesn't load anymore. Let me see my screen. Yeah, we have a little bit of lag and there we go. And, and other things that we've refined is we just literally looked at all the, the parts of the platform and looked at what is, what is the essential stuff? What can we make better? How can we use this time to create an even better product? I'm sorry for the delays here, but um, I will talk you through anyway. So what we've, what we've done is we've really looked at all of these and all of these things we've um, we've built our own um, we've built our own prototypes so we could work with the ergonomics. We've really we've really figured out and ironed out the last kinks on the platform. And now my meeting ended, even though I didn't end it. But I'm also I'm also at the end of my talk. Um, this was very nice. I mean, it's an experience for all of us to to be on stage. And um, the last thing that I wanted to say is, if you're if you're in any way interested in Eden Snacker, then just go to EdenSnacker.com. Um, that is where you can sign up for our partner program. You can also contact me through LinkedIn. My name is Dominic Escoffier. Um, find me, find me on stage, and if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. Um, so I see there is a question in the public chat. Uh, I think it was Christian who asked, "What operating system does this run on?" Are there any controllers for the user? Um, is it allowed to actually have my colleague come up on stage? Because we have our CTO in the audience, and he's much more—he's much better equipped to answer that question. I can also answer mm -hmm. it if you want. Just no whatever, problem. Whatever Hopefully, you prefer. He mm -hmm. Hopefully, he's there. Rick, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. <clears throat> you wanna—you wanna answer that question? Uh, yeah, sure. So, so basically, the the it's running um, Android. It's an Android device, um, and we're running Linux on the on the kiosk. Um, in terms of um, controlling, we to minimize the um, interact like any need for interaction or teaching at the moment. Um, the snackers, a lot of it is on gaze-based control, but we also have controls on the side of the headset if needed. And additionally, there are additional controllers that are supplied if people need uh, specific uses for that. Um, but out the box, generally, we, we try and minimize any sort of um, um, pain points for someone that isn't used to VR to get into the world. So as Dom mentioned, it's straight picking up the headset and diving straight into the content. I see another person asking, how do you ha handle hygiene in between usage? Uh, that's a very good question. I mean, we've thought a lot about what to do with the with the sanitation of the devices. And we're right now, we're not at a point where we can talk about these things publicly, but please stay, please stay tuned. But we're thinking about a different, a couple of different solutions. One of them is obviously UVC um, sterilization of the headsets. We're also thinking about a way of um, integrating um, sanitation into the devices itself or into the package. But these are these are things that we're currently working on with our manufacturers in China. And uh, we're very happy to talk about that in, in just a few weeks. Thank you. If anybody else has a question, you can just raise your hand um, by pressing the raise hand button, which is bottom middle of the screen. If you don't want to talk, talk or you don't have a mic, you can also type the questions in the public chat. Um, while, while, uh, while we're waiting for while we're waiting for while we're waiting for an or for a question from the audience actually i see a couple people with vr and just as a means of doing some market research can those vr people raise their real hands so not the one in verbella but like their virtual hands see there's one guy over there this guy over there no, you're not ready. You're having questions. Okay. Yeah, but the vast majority is on the desktop. That's interesting to see. 
Uh, Ludmilla, I think Hans Holger and Jon yeah. had questions. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, then, oh, you put your hands down. No, I can't read your name. Um, so I saw two people having their hands up. Did you have a question or did you press on the wrong button? I think they might have pressed the wrong button. Yeah, looks like it. Anybody has a question? Then please continue with what you were saying before. Um, I was just trying to find out what the what the ratio is of people that are in VR watching this in VR and people on the desktop, but it looks like there's about 90% or more on the desktop version, which I hope will change in the future by making VR a little bit easier for 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 people. You know, if it wouldn't be as clunky, then we wouldn't be then we wouldn't have these problems and I wouldn't have to tape my mouse to my touch controller. <laughs> But yeah, we're working on that. But if we if we don't have any questions, I'll be around in uh, Verbella all day. Um, find me somewhere there. I'll probably switch to the desktop version, but uh, I'll see you there. Thank you so much. Thank you for your talk. Uh, we're just looking for the next speaker. Uh, Nicola, can you please try step, step on stage? Thank you. Nicola, you're not talking. Okay, you listen to me now? Yeah, perfect. Oh, okay, sorry. I forgot to press the mic button. <laughs> so, hello everyone. I'm, uh, I'm Nicola Perry. I'm a, a senior principal software engineer at uh, 3D Ruler. 3D Ruler is a, soft, is a, is a startup uh, from south of, uh, of France, uh, Aix-en-Provence. And I will talk to you today about the way of the virtual world. But before we need to talk about what is mainstream VR. Mainstream VR will be the VR for everyone. It will be the VR of the future. And everyone will use VR in the future. But today, the, the world of the VR is broken. It's broken because the virtual reality is not, has not been true for everyone. And everyone don't mandatory know what they want, what they need, or even what is virtual reality. To understand that, we first need to define what is the real price of virtual reality. It's not necessarily the price of the computer. It's even not, even if your computer is very powerful, expensive, it's not necessarily the price of the headset you use. It could be even the most high and one, it's because of the way the VR have been designed today. Uh, today, to do VR, you need space and a lot of this space. And do you have this space in your room? Is your room have been designed for this space? I, You need to do a full VR setup today, a VR setup today, and generally you don't have this space. Generally, generally you have the space for a computer, but you don't mandatory have the space for the VR, for VR. So today, space is the most expensive part of VR because in the lot of uh, a city, in fact, it's uh, the price of uh, on the space, the price of the space of your house will be the most expensive parts of your house. But even if you have space, you could break everything. You could break the TV, you could break the furniture, because you, you are too much in the action when you do VR, because you don't see what you have around. 
because you have the headset on. VR could be dangerous sometimes, and danger is not for everyone. I talk about real danger. Danger, you could get injury because you, you can hit the wall, for instance. So it's not in VR, it's in real, it's, it's in the real life. So, so, so today we, we see a lot of solution to, to work out in VR, but okay. So this mean if we see, if we want that the VR become mainstream, this mean that you will use VR often. So uh, is, is today you do work out all the time. Uh, generally no, and uh, why, why you should, why sh VR should be limited to workout and workout only? Uh, let's see. For for instance, your grandma do workout or in VR. Well, some some grandma may do workout sometimes. Why not? It's uh, it's good for them. But this means that they. I, as I said, VR need to be for everyone. And this include your grandma and it's include yourself. The path of the least resistance. It's a law. It's a law you can find in nature, for instance. When you have a electric shock cut, or water flooding, uh, everything go in the shorter way. Uh, the nature don't wait to to do some disaster. They they use the path of the least resistance. And in fact, it's the same for the human. Yes, the the human. I mean, everyone, you including. Uh, Everyone is lazy by definition. Everyone needs a simple solution and not to be tired when they do VR. If, if, if you are, are, don't have a, a simple solution, you will not use VR. Uh, if, you, if it's complicated to use, you have too much cable, you will not use VR. If you are tired, if you need space, you will not use VR. So it's the main, it's the problem. The problem is the VR need to be adapted to people, not the reverse, not. And today the VR is adapted to VR, not to people. And this is something we have to change. But what is the biggest problem of VR today? When you put your headset on your face the first time, when you try VR for the first time, uh, you are impressed at first. You, you, see the, you see the world around you, it's something new. You, you really believe that you are in the new world. But just after that, you, you realize that there is a big problem. You are stuck in the same place. You, you cannot really explore this virtual world and you want to be free. And it's frustrating because you, you are not able to move around. You have, you have limitation, you, you can, it's complicated to interact with this world with your hands, like in the real world. But Okay, to, we, we try to see what we need to do to have the mainstream in VR. So maybe the best is to look at the past. So, okay, what the past teaches? What could be possible if we look at the past, what we can compare to see 
where what's happened in the past to make the to make the the the, the VR mainstream. So the VR exists since very very long time, and it's uh, just recently in 2012 that uh, Palmer Lucky gives gives us a way a new way to see VR with Oculus. But if you look at the the the, com the personal computer, the today the personal computer is become mainstream. So when when this started, how long it take to become mainstream? Well, uh, it, uh, and what was the main key that changed everything? It starts with some uh, computer prototype. The first one was in 1971 with the uh, came back one. Um, and if we compare in, in VR, it's like uh, we can say we start like uh, in 2010 with the first prototype of uh, the, the Oculus uh, uh, made by Palmer Leakey. After uh, he had been sold to Facebook with the help of Brandon Erib in 2012. For the personal computer from 1971 to 1983, you had a lot of different type of computer. You have the Apple One, the Apple Two, the Commodore Pad, the Commodore 64, the TI 91, generally more in USA, uh, the ZX 81, the Spectrum by Sinclair, and this is more in uh, in UK and the Atmos Two and uh, the the At the Doric one. It was in UK. It was in France. It was more in Europe. You have the the MS6. Uh, it was more in Japan. It was uh, a development from with Microsoft and uh, and and some company in Japan it was a platform for many uh, manufacturer. Um, and you can compare that to the number of uh, VR set you have today. Uh, you have uh, a lot of. Uh, uh, VR set today on the market. You have Oculus, you have Vive, and you have many of them. You have some new professional one, uh, not coming every day, but uh, many, many new coming every year. Um, in the same time, uh, in this, uh, oops, oops, I'm stopping. One second, I did a mistake on my. Okay. Um, in the in the same time, in the same time, you had the the, uh, the start of the prototype or something called the mouse. Um, the mouse start very, very early, in fact, and uh, uh, the ideas of the mouse start very early. And the, the first, um, the first one to to create the, to to push the idea of the mouse is dead recently. It was Douglas uh, Elgenbar at a startup uh, at the Stanford Research Institute, and all this evaluate. Uh, uh, have been changed and uh, updated in uh, 1979 by Jean Daniel uh, Nipu, uh, and in fact, it's one of the founder of uh, Logitech today. So, the mouse and the user interface created by Xerox was uh, was one of the key. It was uh, a demonstration was made to uh, Steve Jobs and uh, to Apple and also to to Bill Gates just after that, and uh, uh, this was the key for for people to have uh, something more usable uh, for the computer. Um, in 1984, you had the first uh, Macintosh coming. Uh, and uh, just after you had uh, the, the win 
Windows 1.0. Uh, in the same time, you also have the Atari ST, Commodore Amiga, etc., with mouse. And the second important key was in 1989 uh, with the first uh, uh, presentation of Tim Berners-Lee at the CERN at the border of uh, Switzerland and France uh, to present what is today the World Wide Web. Internet was a bit, a bit before that, but internet uh, was just a connection between each net, but not the user interface of this technology. And after you had the release of uh, Windows 3 with 3.2 with uh, uh, with with access to network and internet, uh, and in fact everything become more concentrated. So as you see before, you have a lot of computer and uh, starting uh, uh, in, in uh, 19, 19 uh, uh, you, you had the Windows uh, take, uh, almost take all the market, and only one com one kind of computer with only one kind of operating system, mostly. But it's uh, you, you have to wait something like uh, between 2001 and 2009 to wait to to have the the, the, the mainstream computer become uh, the computer become mainstream. Okay, so. If we do a little analysis about this, it took around 35 years for the personal computer to become mainstream. The mouse was a game changer, and the web definitely did the touchdown. Since the start of the modern VR, Initiated by Primer Lucky in 2012, we can imagine the same road than the one of the PC. So you had the prototype and the go to market. You have the, a copy, a clone of the same product of the same headset. Every, at one point, you have all the headset was not compatible and it become, it changed just after that. You generally, today, it's more today, you have a more Person, you have more professional usage uh, than uh, mass market usage, even if you have some, uh, some game usage uh, in PS4, for instance. And to the end, you had you had to you had to have something to to have the better user experience for people, something more adaptive, like the mouse, like the like the user uh, user experience, less maybe less cable, maybe something that you don't monitor in each place. Uh, you will have to harmonize and to, have, uh, to be more compatible. It's it something already happened with uh, OpenXR, for instance, even if it's not yet uh, on fully on the market, but it, it, the, at least the specification are there. You will have some kind of market consolidation because I guess you, uh, because of this kind of harmonization, you will have Almost the fine, you, you may have more power headset or something, but you may have less company on the market to 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 to, to show up and, and, and give some new kind of products. And you will have to have something like the web uh, with interconnection and interoperability, something simple to use for everyone, not uh, how well kind. Uh, system, uh, this is very important. Uh, and if we don't have that, we will never have mainstream. So it's real, we will have to create something like the web for the VR. But okay, what is the mouse of VR? What could be the mouse of VR? Uh, to know that, we need to define what is a mouse, okay? Uh, a mouse is two, two things. You have the action, and you have the deplacement, the locomotion uh, on your table. It's two different uh, features. And okay, what we have today in VR? Today in VR, you are the controller because 
you can look around. Okay, you are you 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 are one of the part of the controller. Uh, the headset is is one controller. You also have your end with or without uh, controller, without device. Okay, but okay, you need to have locomotion now because this is this is only to enter right. So okay, you can use the controller, but do you really work with your hand? I, I don't think in real life you work with your hand. It's uh, it's strange. Generally, you work with your feet. So you need a controller to for your feet. And okay, in fact, as you did understand, I think it's what we do. I will not have the sound. So we, we have been uh, released on PC and on uh, PS4. We are the only uh, device on, uh, uh, on PS4 not designed by uh, Sony. And we are a French company, so it's, uh, it's interesting. <laughs> uh, I will give you the link on the chat if you want to see the video with the sound. Okay, let's continue. Okay, it's gone. No, where is it? Okay, it's here. Okay. So the video uh, is, is or could be because uh, it's possible some other uh, kind of device could uh, could show up. But today, I I think it's one of the best solution to have the locomotion in the air with all the definition I showed you before. And you can still interact with the real world because you have your hand free. So, okay, the mouse of the air, if you, if you compare it, this means you can interact with the VR world with your hands and you can use your feet for the locomotion. And recently we released another Another stuff we are compatible with the Quest. Uh, it's not yet available, but it's interesting because with the Quest you can use your your hand directly now, and if you use your hand, you don't have excuses that you don't have a controller.
Okay, so we we have we have it on. Uh, we 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 did the version for for the quest, and this could change a lot because you you would have your end free to directly interact, and this simplified a lot the usage of VR for new people. Okay. The way the, 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 the brain reacts in VR, in fact, it's uh, interesting for the 3D reader because uh, the brain is plastic and the, the 3D and, and, and the adoption to, and the, the, the learning curve to go to the, to, you, to the usage of the 3D reader is very short. You, you will be able to understand it and use it in few minutes and your brain will adapt immediately. So you will be, you will have uh, the VR directly, uh, but you will have your hand free. So you will, you will uh, uh, have, an, uh, have a feeling of better immersion. And as you use your feet, uh, do you, you will have less motion sickness. Not you still have more. You still have um, uh, you could, could still be uh, still have motion sickness, but you will have less. And what will change more because we have some experience uh, we did. Uh, it will be the frame rate in fact, the headset and um, uh, for, instance, for instance with the PlayStation 4, the PSVR headset, you can go up to um, 120 hertz. Uh, you can have the index two uh, can go to up to 144 hertz, and this is this will be very important to not have the sickness. I think more than than or many other stuff. And the fact to use a 3D reader plus uh, a very good um, uh, frame rate is we we generally don't have people sick. Uh, in fact, in general, what is important for the sickness part is the fact that your brain is not too much disturbed, that uh, your brain can uh, can understand what what the, what, you, what uh, don't see don't don't see the difference with, between the action you do and what what the eyes see and what the body feel, and uh, and this is make the that you are you are sick or not. So, what what is important, and uh, and uh, I, I put I will put the, the link of the article I, I made uh, about this on the, on the chat if you want. Um, what is important to have mainstream VR is the fact that the VR need to be adapted to people that uh, it's possible to use it without complication that you will have some key events. Um, like like for the, the the personal computer will help it and I I think personally and I hope that we are one of these key events uh, and I really think that uh, what will be the very the, the main 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 important part uh, it will be the, the web of the VR so some people call that uh, the multiverse the the was this, uh, uh, etc. But for me, it need to be. You know, we need to be think like internet, and this will be, in fact, uh, the key of everything. Okay. If you have any question. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, we'll have time for one quick question. If anybody in the public wants to ask it, please uh, press on the right hand button, which is in the bottom middle bottom of your virbella screen yes simon i see that you have a question please yeah. hi uh first of all i really like uh, the, the this device to move around i was thinking about uh, uh, if you ever think uh, about uh, made a device for people who want to stand up uh, while uh, doing the war experience because uh, i think that this device can be used only if you are sit down yes but uh, it's a, it's a very uh, thank you for the question because it's a very important point. Um, we could we we have we we know the way to do it in, in standard, but I, we don't think it's a it's a good way. 
Uh, today, today, when you are in computer, when you use your computer, you are generally sit. And I think most of you, as you use, you are in this room, and as you watch this conference, and you don't use Bernardo Rivier, you are sitting in front of your screen looking at, uh, at this application, and you are not standing. You are sit, most of you. Uh, so this is the first point. Uh, so why we need to do the same in VR? I, I, I don't manage to really understand this, that, this need. It's, it, because when you are, okay, in real life, when you, when you fine, in VR, you, 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 you see that you are standing, but uh, this means that you need to be standing in, uh, in VR. Fine, I, I mean, when you, when you are standing in VR, you need to be standing in real life. Uh, okay, just think about it. When you, when you work in the street, not in, not in VR, in real life, okay? When you, when you work in the street, you are, okay, you are, you are standing, you walk, you go to one place, to another place. Uh, okay, so do you realize that you actually work? You just go to one place, to another place. You don't, uh, you are not conscient to, to say to all your muscle of all your leg, all your feet that you, you, you work. You just go, okay? Uh, and I think it's not that important. I think what is important, what makes the immersion is the fact to not think about the fact you, 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 you have locomotion. This is what is important. Uh, to, to, to the fact that you can interact with the world without thinking, without as a constraint of the joystick or and, and, and the basis you can directly use your hand. Um, okay, and another point important it's something we realized recently. We talk about a lot of um, uh, big uh, accounts, big account company like uh, French SNCF, uh, um, uh, Air France, and uh, and many other. And and I think it will be the same in US because US are a, big, a lot more uh, um, uh, linked to the to the legal part. And in fact, those companies don't want to take the risk to have people standing in VR. They want to use VR, but they don't want to have the, to take the risk to have people standing in VR because it's too much dangerous uh, to have injury and to, 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 have, to have to go to the court for, for those people. And think about it. It's, it's something important, in fact, in some way. So yes, it, it could feel natural because it's what you see that you stand, but since it's very, if it's very important. So yeah, technically we know the way to do it standing, but we are, we are not sure that it's a good idea. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Unfortunately, we're already running 10 minutes late behind the schedule. If you have any follow questions, you can always ask them in the public chat. And thank you for your wonderful presentation. Thank you. Right. Uh, could the next speaker, Victor, uh, come onto the stage, please? I, I will put the, the link of my article on the on the chat. Okay. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Victor. Is it good? Oh, no, it's good. Perfect. Thank you. Hello, Ophelie. Can you hear me? Uh, I think she's not Hi. there. Hi, Victor. Uh, I I can hear you. Okay. So I guess that if you can hear me, everybody can hear me. Correct. Everybody can. Okay. Good. Well, uh, just, uh, sorry, just one second. First, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm actually super excited to be here. It feels uh, super new. Me, Victor? I'm, yes. I'm sorry. It's just that Ludmila was talking, and uh, I think she has something to ask everybody before. Yes, please. Um, I'm sorry. Okay, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Uh, does everybody see the presentation? If it shows you an, an error, or you can't see the screen, please press uh, the refresh button on the top right corner. Thank you. And if you have, uh, if you don't see it, so yes, please press the, press the refresh button top right corner of the middle screen. You have this little refresh icon. Okay, perfect. Uh, if you have any other questions, please uh, direct message me or message it in the public. Thank you. And please turn off your mic during the presentation. Let's go on, Victor. Sorry to interrupt you. Okay, is it good now? I can hear you. Can everybody hear in the audience? Mm -hmm. Yes. I okay. So I guess this is good. 
Ophélie, can you confirm we're all good? Ludmilla, can you confirm we're good? I can hear, I can see the presentation. Should be good. Yeah, perfect. Okay, good. Thank you very much. So, uh, so my name is Victor Agulon. I'm the co-founder and the, and the CEO of, uh, of Targo. I just want to say a word before to the, to the team of, uh, of Laval Virtual who just proved this event, uh, which is actually pretty crazy. Uh, I didn't expect that many people, I didn't expect to have that much fun. So I just want to congratulate them uh, because it, for the event industry, uh, this crisis is, a, is especially tough. So I want to congratulate them and thank them for holding them, for holding this event. So uh, we're Keep gonna start. Being there. Sorry, no, you're welcome. Um, for the, we, we're gonna have to spend the, the next 20 minutes uh, together. And I wanna use this time to, to talk about uh, creating mainstream uh, virtual reality experiences and, uh, and what it means uh, for us at Targo. So Targo, we are virtual reality media, which means that uh, we create uh, VR experiences um, that we distribute online and in VR streaming, um, in VR streaming platforms and in VR cinemas around the world. These experiences are documentaries that last from um, 10 to 15 minutes on stories that are usually uh, going to allow you to leave what you can't, right? So our goal is really to take something that exists, to film it and to bring it to the users in the form of a documentary, a story that's gonna be very, very compelling. The reason we do this is because today we think that there's no really mainstream content in virtual reality. When you look at what's going on, I think there's a great divide between two extremes. Uh, on one side, you have old games that are gonna target mostly gamers, uh, and that uh, that work extremely well, but that you know really are address the niche of the gamers. Google slide not working. Mm -hmm. uh, please press um, the refresh one side button. You have the gamers, and on the other side you have all the. Let me see. Is it working now? The person in the public. Okay, good. Who doesn't I'm see the refresh every time refresh. I. I, um, no, you, you I shouldn't technically refresh. And so we have the great divide between gamings uh, and on the other side, we have uh, experiences that I think are very artistic, that are extremely well crafted, but that are mostly targeted to uh, festivals and uh, elitist audience. And we think that there is a, an audience, a big space in the middle that remains uh, unaddressed, that is the space for mainstream uh, experiences. It's, it's difficult to define what a mainstream experience is, but we can define what it's not. and. Very briefly, what we can say is there is a balance between the stories that are going to speak to to everybody, you know, the kind of thing that we're used to watching on Netflix, on TV, on these kind of platforms, but for virtual reality. And today, VR, obviously, and what, what it looks like is that the the driving force is uh, is gaming. And the, re the way we see it is that it's not because VR is a gaming console, it's because you have more games that are going to attract uh, gamers. And so today we have an industry that's working around games, uh, that's generating revenue around games because you have lots of great uh, gaming content. And that's why we at Targo, we, we really believe that making mainstream VR content uh, is about making mainstream VR. It's because if we're able to create content that gives people reason to put on VR headset, you're going to give them reason to come to watch and we're going to be able to extend the base. And that's why we're focusing on, ma on mainstream um, experiences okay slides no show please refresh yes i can hear it Ta -da. okay so i'm going to refresh every every single time but, but the idea i mean the slides are just a supporting um element and uh, most of it's going to rely in the in the in the text but the, the, the end goal for us is that if we offer great content, we're going to mainstream content, we're going to bring mainstream audience. And for us, it's about the success of VR um, in general. So the way I want to talk about mainstream content uh, today is about two main uh, defining factors is what is a great uh, content itself. I want to dive into how we try to make uh, what we identify as mainstream content and really humbly try to explain what we've, we've found on the way. And the second way is uh, the distribution. How do we distribute this? For, for making sure that this is going to be seen as widely as possible and that as many people as possible are going to, um, to be able to enjoy it. So let's start with, um, with the content um, first. I think when you go to the core of what virtual reality is, um, I, think a, I think a big part of what virtual reality is, is that uh, it brings more depth of information. 
what I mean when I say that it brings depth of information is that there's lots of technologies that allow us to get access to information faster, right? The internet uh, allows us to get access to information faster. Uh, when you go on Twitter, you can see all the latest news very quickly. VR is not a good fit for this kind of context. VR is good if you want to establish the kind of information that brings you to another level. It's, it's a way to, to know more about a topic, to feel more about it, but it's not a way to access it faster. So it means that in terms of the way people dedicate their time to VR, they're not going to dedicate it in the same way, you know, you go uh, on Instagram, watch stories or on Facebook. It's like, it's a moment that they're going to dedicate for it. So it requires that we really think about this in the same way that people go to cinema, right? It means that we have to go to do something that are really incredible, that are going to justify the fact that people are going to put on a headset for 10 or 15 minutes on their head. And we have to provide them a level of experience that is really, really um, incredible. One of the things also that's really defining for us is that there is one of the other things that's really defining for us is that there is um, a big, big room for nonfiction in VR. We've seen a lot of things in VR, and what we think works super well is uh, documentaries. There is something that is really magical, and that's ineffable in the way it works, but being able to explore our world, like real sites, real location, meet real people, and explore what's really going on on our planet, in the way it works, there is something really magical about this. And that's what we are focusing on. We don't want to work on fiction. Our really end game is to bring the real world to virtual reality, to allow people to do more, really leave what they can't, but that's happening in the, the, in the real world. So before I dive into the specifics of um, what makes a great content and what we're trying to achieve every time we make a new documentary, I want to take the example of our last documentary, which was uh, rebuilding Notre Dame. It's a documentary about the cathedral before and after the fire that we produced in partnership with um, with Oculus. And uh, for this documentary, we try to tick all the boxes that make a great VR content. And I want to dive into them and try to explain how we think about them and how we thought about them for this specific documentary. VR is a visual technology. So VR has to start with a place. Um, we think of where are you going to be? And that's probably one of the most important questions is there's lots of stories that don't belong to VR just because they don't happen in a place that is interesting enough for the medium. So we have to think native in terms of VR, in terms of stories that are going to fit. And the first question we ask is, where is this happening? And the place is defining, because that's the moment, uh, that's what people are going to remember. It's where they are, what happened when they were there. It's what is the iconic shot that you want people to remember? And for us, for this piece about Notre Dame, it was very obvious. It was about going inside the cathedral and being able to see what the damage was. So this is for us the iconic shot, right? You're under the holes. This is inside the cathedral. Uh, and these are really the, you know, this is a place that justifies using VR just because the, what you want here is a depth of information, right? You don't want to know if the fires happened or so. You just want to really understand what's going on, what it looks like. So this is a place that is going to work extremely well in VR. And having that shot, this ability to be in the middle of the cathedral was essential to us. So the place is the first one. But the second most important element for us uh, is the people. You know, if, if we were just to focus on place, we could just go on, uh, on Google Maps and go and use a Google Street View to watch uh, things and see, you know, what they look like. The second most important element is the people we bring in. There is something and I think it goes back to the depth of information. It's about how much VR is, um, is irrational in the way it works. There is, uh, you know, it's a form of attraction, something magical about being sit sitting in front of somebody in virtual reality and seeing this person talk to you firsthand. So carefully selecting the characters you're going to include in your story is extremely important. For this piece on Notre Dame, we chose to focus on four characters who reflect the variety of the, of the cathedral. So it's a priest, it's a person in charge of rebuilding the cathedral, it's a mayor of Paris, it's a historian, it's all the people uh, who have something special to say, something meaningful, something almost intimate about the cathedral to tell you, and you're going to hear it directly uh, from them. And so carefully selecting people is really, really a key element in everything we do in, in mainstream uh, VR. You want to be able to create a personal connection in, uh, in stories. And once you've had people in place, which, which do sound like basic elements, I think the third most basic element is uh, the story. So having a good story to tell in VR uh, is not as obvious. 
And uh, it's something that's being overlooked a long, long time. Uh, as you know, sometimes lots of people thought about uh, the experience part uh, being uh, in itself important enough, you know, just that if you put uh, people, let's say skydiving, this is going to be enough. No, what you need is a really, really strong story that's going to justify uh, the fact that people look at the place and listen to the people. And for Notre Dame, the story was obvious. We had some footage of the cathedral before the fire, and we used this with the footage of the cathedral after the fire. And the whole documentary is about recreating uh, the cathedral. And that's why the documentary is called uh, Rebuilding. The goal for us is really to to offer uh, this experience of you know, rediscovering the, the cathedral before um, and after the fire. And these three, three elements have to be combined um, in very careful ways. And the more time passes by, the more we realize that you know, narration is definitely the most uh, important element. The ability to guide a viewer, to guide somebody in a VR experience is not evenly uh, distributed. And uh, this is not my job, but this is the job of the directors with whom we work. And, um, and what we see is that a good director, a good editor are absolutely essential. And that if you think that just having beautiful imagery is going to be enough for your experience to be great, I think it's just about missing half of the, of the picture uh, in virtual reality. So narration comes out like, let's say, an overarching um, element that, that leads to encompass the place, the story, and the people to make something meaningful. And this is not only what, what we're trying to achieve with Notre Dame. I, I want to take other examples because I think they, they kind of show what we mean when we say mainstream. Uh, when we say mainstream, we just want to talk about things that people know, you know, the kind of thing that interests people that makes the headline. You know, we went to Mosul also to film the whole paragliders. We are resuming their life after ISIS. So what we did there was that we went there with a famous French journalist. Uh, we went all around the city. So we had these people who were telling us their personal stories, and it does fit all the elements because you have the story of people who survived, you have the people that actually survived who are telling you their story, and you get to meet them, and you get a place which is absolutely incredible. And for us uh, who've never been, most of us who've never actually been to places torn by war, uh, it's it's an incredible experience. So this is a kind of story also that that encompasses that goes into the the mainstream uh, scope for us. We did this other experience with a with an explorer who's a, the youngest French explorer who actually crossed the South Pole, fifty one day, fifty one day um, on his own. And the same, you have a place Antarctica, a character, the explorer, and a story, which is how is he going to cross the South Pole in fifty days? And every every single story, every single documentary has to be able to be um, interesting to seem uh, like, oh, I want to see that just when you when you say these, these three elements. And this sound, it, it sounds very basic, but if you look at this, at all the VR production through this lens, you see that not that many actually come, come, um, come in well. And this is something that we are building on the way. So we are learning constantly, but I think these are the three elements that we've really identified that have come in every single, uh, in every single time. Two things that we've identified also that work extremely well. Uh, but we don't know why, but we've noticed them. And because I think it's part of the artistry of, of making VR, uh, it's like a collection of small things that make people stay, that make an experience worthy to look at. I think the first one um, is geometry and depth. Because 360 is 360, many, many people will tell you that um, it's not important when you place the camera. The more I look at VR, the more I can see beautiful shots and we can understand what makes a good shot. There's two elements. First, the depth of like where are you placed actually in the footage and the geometry. And we see that geometry is just an essential element of having beautiful, beautiful shots. So in everything we're trying to make, um, we are including the elements of geometry. And this shot here is a screenshot from the Notre Dame experience where you're behind Gargoyle. So you have the depth spilling right next to you. You feel like you're there and you have, you know, in, in, in geometrically aligned behind, you have the, the, the spire of the cathedral that was there before the, the fire. These are elements that we look in every single um, documentary. Another thing that works extremely well, but we don't know really why, uh, is the reflections. Uh, the reflection of light on water, I think it's just because it comes in, in as a, you know, it, it recreates really the feeling we have in the real, in the real life. It works extremely well. So whenever you're next to water, whenever you're next to, um, to a mirror, there is something that is, you know, creating that illusion 
that you're really there and these are sensations that you used to have only um, in the in the real world the last element for for us is uh, the movement so it's been highly debated uh, topic about uh, in VR, like should you make movement or not there's different opinions uh, we think it helps us move a story forward and this is a screenshot from a from a documentary with an astronaut that we made um, you see here there is geometry uh, there is a beautiful scenery and there is a slider that moves slide slowly toward the astronaut when you get to meet him and these are elements that create beautiful shots so these three elements have no uh, hard component in them but they're part of what makes an experience uh, really beautiful and worthy uh, to look at so these are small things that we've noticed that work really well um, without necessarily knowing why but that we these are patterns and i think these patterns help us make uh, the best VR experiences that, that we can today. So once we have good content, good mainstream content, you know, the content that speaks to everybody that, you know, you can pitch in, a, in, in one line and that's actually seducing and that gives you the, the will to watch it. Um, the distribution is the second most important aspect. Uh, today, VR is also very divided between a production company, distribution company. We're trying to go beyond the divide and actually distribute also our own content. So for instance, uh, when we work with Oculus, we distribute under our own name, uh, we publish to our own channels. This is something that's important for us because you can't make great content if you don't have the great strategy to, to release it uh, afterwards. For us, the key element um, of making mainstream content uh, is also because mainstream is a necessity. If, if you don't make mainstream content, you're just going to target a niche in the niche because may, let's, let's agree that VR is not the most commonly spread technology. So we need to target mainstream uh, audience to be able to, to reach a sufficient amount of, uh, of people. So it's not only because the content in, in VR is going to be there. It's also because that's all the only way that we can find the market um, with it. I guess most of you are familiar with the two ways to reach the, the mainstream audience. Uh, there's offline and online distribution. I, I just want to start with the offline distribution because I think that it's what's been proven. Um, we work with a fair amount of arcades all around the world um, and location-based entertainment. So these are places, I guess you know all of them, but most of you know what it is about, but you know these are places where you have like 20 to 50 headsets, you go, you buy a ticket and it's like a cinema. What is not proven today is whether the arcade format works. It is that, you know, just you go into a room to rent access to a VR headset for, let's say, 20 euros. Uh, you can play as many games as you want. I don't think this is proven, and I don't think that this is going to last very long. What works, though, and what's working extremely well is uh, the arcades that are targeted on one specific use case. And I think a very clear example is The Void, which is, um, you know, targeting on video games, really focused on video games. It works extremely well. Um, you have Wild Immersion, which is a, a cinema in Paris, which is basically a virtual zoo. Um, you go there, you buy a ticket, and you can, you know, go see all the animals in the savannah. It's very entertaining, very uh, wide audience, very mainstream. And you have also Flyview, which is a, an attraction in Paris where you get to fly all over Paris. You know, you're in a, a jetpack, and uh, it's a beautiful drone experience. And all these experiences work extremely well, whether they're games, uh, natural, or culture. Uh, because they're targeted and they have one use case which is very precise. People go to the cinema to watch this movie, people go to Wild Immersion to go see animals, and people go to fly you to fly over Paris. And these are very clear use cases, and I think it's working really well. So that's one thing that we don't need to discuss much more because I think the use case here is proven. What we see and what's most important for us is uh, what's going on with the online distribution business. So online distribution, I think, goes from very, very far back. Um, we've gone through the first step, you know, which is we didn't know if user-generated content was going to work. Uh, you had platforms like Via that really thought that, you know, people working with um, 360 cameras will help your breakthrough. Uh, I think everybody comes back from this, realize this is not going to happen, and that VR is more a cinematic-like experience. So once we got to that part, I think there is a a market that starts to appear and um and i want to see what what how we think about it so the way we think about it is you can't think about mainstream distribution if you don't think about the hardware uh, our approach has always been to focus on the highest common denominator what i mean is that 
if five years ago you were focusing only on interactive six degrees of freedom virtual reality, you could probably have reached 10 people. This is all being very quickly because you have new hardware, new generation of headsets. You, you know, we went from the Gear VR to the Quest in like two and a half years. Uh, and we see this change in the way people consume content. So the evolution we've been following is from 360 video, very simple, to 360 stereoscopic videos, slightly more elaborate, uh, to six degrees of freedom experiences uh, in nonfiction. And this has to remain the North Star because if you don't think about how people consume the content, you're never going to create the right content. So this is why it's important for us to think that, you know, to really have this uh, creation and distribution approach of content because we need to think uh, both at the same time. So today with the Quest, all the headset, the, the Focus and all these headsets that are autonomous and uh, offer six degrees of freedom, we see an improvement and we can bring better and better experiences, but we have to follow what's in the market, right? For instance, today, if you're working on haptics only experiences, your market's going to be such a niche that I don't think you're going to, you're going to just address the mainstream experience, the audience. So that's how we think, uh, that's how we think about it. What we see though in the, in the VR online market is that people stream VR content. Like this is not a question anymore. It is proven. Um, all of our experiences reach approximately 150,000 uh, people in VR headsets. So people stream VR content. Uh, the approach we've had is that we really diversify the sources where we get the streams. So we're on YouTube VR, Samsung VR, Oculus TV VR within, and all of these platforms distribute our content and people watch it. We can see that people spend time in this, and this is actually a very good sign that, you know, uh, the mainstream content belongs uh, to VR. That's, that's the most encouraging thing um, we've seen, we've seen today. The, the kind of, you know, like where this all mitigates is that people don't pay for the content online. And that's like lots of questions about this. We, we don't know the answer. Uh, we don't have a solution for this, but even though people watch the content, people are not willing to pay for the, for the content. We've been uh, working with several partners to put uh, some of our best content behind paywalls and, you know, do some, some period of, of time where we release the content only behind the paywall and we see whether people are going to buy it or not. What we see is that there's too little people who purchase the content behind paywalls to actually make sense economically out of it. So what you lose in visibility, you don't make up within the money. So the big question today we have is people watch the content, they have interest in it, but they're not willing to pay for it. I do think it's also related to the fact that people are used not to pay for videos and that video probably uh, still has a, a value proposition that remains uh, too low. I mean, at least that's what we can see right now for the 360 videos. Um, and the, the value proposition is not there yet for people. So I think the next step and where everybody is at today is that we know how to make great content. The, the industry has pretty much solved this problem. Uh, we need to focus more, and that's our mission, to really focus on mainstream audiences, uh, stuff that really speaks to everybody. And then it's our interest is to making people pay for it and try to you know test their willingness to actually pay for having the the best um, the best content. I, I can see some of your questions. I'm gonna I'm gonna answer after after that. So what we see um, as the the future of of this as a as a conclusion, the key element for us is to thinking native to VR. Uh, if you think of VR just as a leverage to get to other platforms, it's not going to work. Even though the market is small, uh, even though maybe you know 150,000 people who watch uh, the experiences doesn't small, sound small per se, uh, this is the only way we're going to break through in VR. So we need to focus very seriously in how to make and distribute natively uh, in virtual uh, reality in terms of content. The second thing is that, and that's what I was talking to you about in terms of what we see today. Today we have a market that's based on gamers, and gamers are willing to pay for games. We have a market for videos because people watch videos, but people are not willing to pay for videos. Our assumption today is that people don't pay for video because the format video is not identified as a format for which you should pay. So our assumption is that a solution, a viable solution for the market is that we actually take game technologies. So it's six degrees of freedom and interactive experiences, and that we blend it with our expertise of nonfiction and documentaries to make things that people are going to be willing to purchase. So this is what we're currently working on. It's about building the next 
phase of VR, and that's going to be also um, present, and that's going to be the tech that's going to be used when we change hardware, when we go from headsets of VR to AR headsets, maybe Apple, maybe Facebook one day. We know everyone's working on, and we know that the right tech is going to be real-time rendered. So, thank you very much for taking, um, for coming here and for uh, for your attention. Uh, I've seen few questions, so I'm very. I don't know if we have time. Uh, Ophelia, you can tell me. Thank you. Um, we have so, we have some minutes and, uh, for two questions. Do we have time for question? I look uh, at the you. We, yes. We, no. Two questions. We have time for two questions. I'd say. Okay, so uh, let's take the, the question of the Netflix uh, of, um, of VR. Uh, it's uh, we've seen lots of people today trying to implement, uh, you know, subscription-based model. Maybe it works for them, but the thing is, it doesn't work for the for the users. And I think it's way too early today to justify uh, paying, let's say, ten euros to subscribe subscription model. So what we see is that this is not happening today and that the, the volume you need to make it really uh, viable uh, on, on that there yet. And so that's actually one of the reasons we've talked, we talk with lots of people. We talk with uh, Samsung VR, we talk with Oculus, we talk with all, I would say, the, the platforms that have a massive reach and all of them are not implementing a paywall because the thing that the money they can make out of it is, um, is not essential compared to the visibility that they're going to lose. So the Netflix of VR, uh, I don't think we we're quite there yet, and we need a much much bigger market um, for that to happen. Oh, thank you. I think there was. Uh, so the question of the advertising model, advertising model, uh, why not? It's it's just that VR experiences that provide great experiences are expensive to produce, and um, and that usually the budgets by advertisers don't. Um, work out yet. So basically, in terms of source of revenue, how we do today is so we sell licensing online rights to lots of uh, companies. It can be telecom companies, it can be streaming platforms. And the other way is we advertise in um, in location-based entertainment with arcades. We set specific uh, um, experiences based around, uh, let's say, uh, one one of the experiences. But these are the two ways we, we monetize yet. We, we don't see third-party brands uh, that are not involved in entertainment or media Act actively pay on VR um, visibility. And so I think if there's no more question, I want, I'm going to to leave you um, to leave you here, right? And if you want, I'm I'm a very you know you can reach me on my email, you can reach me on a on a on, on Twitter, wherever I answer for all my emails, of course. So thank you very much, guys, and congratulations again to the Levant team because this has been a quite a quite an experience. I don't know how we can take a selfie, so I'm just going to take a let's say a, a, like a, a picture from the back. But uh, you, that's fine. That's if you have a great day. So. I guess everyone is uh, hearing me. So hi, my name is uh, Severine Nation. I'm happy to be with you today in Virbella and Laval Virtual World. So it's an amazing world. Uh, so Ludmila will help me change in the slides. So she will have the, the hands on the, on the presentation. So I will present you uh, Speedanet. It's a digital studio and Sphere, which is an authoring tool for VR conception. So we can go further, Ludmina. Okay, so to present you the, the digital studio, we've been in the training industry for about 20 years now. And we are, uh, we are 40 people working at the digital studio and we create content, let's say uh, digital content learning. And we also um, move into the immersive learning for a few years now. We are creating some, um, we used to, to, to create the content with, uh, with a tool called Storyline and uh, back five, six years ago, we were looking for a tool to create content in VR and to have a deep training scenario. So we decided to create our own, uh, our own tool, which is here with, uh, with eight, 10 developers working on the, the development of this, uh, of this tool. 
and I will present you some creation of what we have done with the immersive uh, learning content and what our customers are also doing with this, uh, with this tool. So this is um, an overview of what we have, um, we are, we are, I mean, an overview of the, of the studio. We also are uh, experts in LMS as we are created on our own uh, LMS. And we are also uh, supporting our customer in the consulting, consulting for deployment, for, uh, for content, for blended learning, for all the environment of the training uh, in a large corporation. So we can move on to the next, uh, to the next. Uh... <laughs> okay, so I will present you uh, six use case. So don't forget to be pretty quick. So my six use case will be starting with a, a 3D environment. So you'll have two with a 3D environment for Air France and ABB. You'll have two with a pictures 360 in VR for the Thailand Vinci and two in video 360 with uh, SNCF. And that gives you an idea of, um, of all the, the kind of content you can create with the tool and what kind of the training scenario you can propose to your customers <coughs> or the option you can, you can go on to this kind of, um, of uh, sorry. <laughs> of immersive learning. So let's uh, skip to the next slide. Okay, so the first one is Air France. So I'm sure you all know the airline company of Air France and they had uh, a need. So the need was to train the, the cat to stop a water link from the toilet from a specific plane. So I will not mention which plane uh, to avoid the panic of uh, getting on to the plane again. So we had to modelize in 3D uh, the plane toilet very sexy. And we did have to, uh, to create this 3D environment, this 3D toilets to help the, the, the cabin crew to stop this water leak. So the, the solution was first to create the modeling sets and then to create a training scenario for the cabin crew to, uh, to experiment and to test their knowledge into that uh, maintenance, I would say, process. And they could do it in a face-to-face -face training. So Air France uh, deliver face-to-face -face training with trainers and they do have a, lava, um, a virtual room where they have a, a large, uh, large number of, uh, of sets that are using Oculus Quest. And they ask the learners to come to the into a real VR environment and to process with the uh, with the exercise. So instead of watching a PowerPoint and uh, just reading, they can have the controller on their hands and they can do the the same process they will have to do in real uh, environment into the plane. So they can uh, break, they can uh, make errors, they can test their knowledge into that uh, process of stopping a water leak in these toilets. If you have any questions, feel free to uh, to ask me. And let's skip to the ABB slide now. So the ABB slide, the ABB is a large company of producing uh, electrical elements. So their needs was to uh, to train the people, the salespeople, um, dedicate to all the food and beverage to um, to have a good, I would say, the good talking and the good discussion about presenting the family products for the food and beverage environment and to train the, the, the sales force into um, a kind of um, on knowing better their product they have in the catalog. So we uh, we did a large modeling of a, of a factory. When I talk about a factory, it was a cookies factory. And we have to go through the bills, through the production, through the, the packaging. So it was all the process from the start till the end where they ship the cookies to our supermarket. And um, the training scenario was just to have, a, to have an overview of this, uh, this factory plant and this mill and to ask the sales force to do a kind of a hunting ABB uh, project. So they have to find out into their environment where they could find, um, where they could find the, the ABB product and they could have some information. So it's a, 
it's a nice way and funny way to uh, engage the learner into this uh, this kind of a scenario and this uh, this has been developed in different languages as well so it's been uh, developed in um, in chinese in uh, well i'm not going to list all the languages but uh, the, the deployment as it was in 360 on desktop or in VR on headset was deployed quite largely and uh, was pretty successful regarding the, um, the feedback we had from the, from the learners. Going into the next, uh, the next use case, you can skip to the next uh, slide going to the, the pictures. So this is the oil industry Total, so I'm sure you all know about Total, and um, they came to us and say, okay, we have a 360 picture of a raffinery, we have an overview, uh, we took some pictures 360 with a drone, we have um, kind of many resources in, uh, in pictures, but we don't know how to use it. So we co-write and we co construct the training scenario and we we help them with a uh, with a soft again with sphere integrating the the pictures and going through the process where they had to train the the their people to um to launch a compressor so it's pretty technical it's difficult for the for them to train the people on site to bring the people on site because it's a safety environment so they have to go through different safety rules and that was um, this way that we thought to offer to uh, to Total to use their uh, their uh, their resources of the pictures 360 and to integrate some assets to link to um, all the processing of using this compressor. So uh, they the people could be could be trained in advance and once they have to go and to uh, to do some maintenance uh, exercise into the compressor they could they, they, they knew already because they have been processing and they have been um, they've been they, they went through the exercise and uh, they knew where to push the bottom and to stop things and to go further into the uh, the launching of the of this compressor so again it was a an a face face training and it was to put people in situation in this kind of a real environment and to put it in in a, in a nice yeah in a, in a real environment so that they could uh, they could again experience the uh, they testing and manage to uh, to do the the exercise on the compressor if we go to the next one, uh, the next slides, which will be uh, Vinci, which is the building industry, we uh, we work with this uh, with this company uh, who wanted to. They, they had a, they had a, a, a regulation with how to train people about the safety in on site. It was a career, and they have to. Um, to help the trainee, I mean, to help the learner, the worker who was working on site to identify the wrong scenario, the wrong, um, when you have a, a wrong engine or a car or a truck was, uh, was parked, uh, not in a proper way or people walking on the site, the proper um, site where they had to walk. So we work also together. We went on site on the query site to do some shootings 360. And from this shooting 360, from these pictures, we write this training scenario to have a hunting risk. And the, the workers on site was, were, was playing their own uh, role, actually. They were um, doing their own role because they were um, standing in the not in a correct position they were parking in a wrong in the wrong way so that was to help the trainee to identify the the risk so what we decided to do is just to have the okay to have the wrong scenario and to say to the to the learners okay here is a hunting risk you have a certain time to find out in this environment see where are the five risks around you so there is no point of interest. There is there is no sign saying here there is a um, there is some mistake. So they have to click, and when they click on this invisible trigger, they could they they could figure it out that they find out, and that they uh, they have this kind of um, of a bad scenario. So the deployment of this was pretty easy because it was an offline uh, presentation. So they downloaded on uh, on the uh, mobile uh, devices to um, to train the people 
on site before entering the uh, the query site. Uh, let's move on to the next one. So this is a use case uh, SNCF. We uh, we work with SNCF um, again. This is an industrial company, and they have to train the people about the safety rules into a workshop, a maintenance workshop, where they have to, uh, yeah, where they repair all the cabins and uh, and stuff like that. So it was more a sensibilization about the um, the safety rules and this uh, the risk they can uh, face into this workshop. So they just have to to go around this. Uh, it was a video shooting 360 that we've done on site, and we had a. Um, it, it was more an easy scenario. It's just to show you another view of what we are able to do with uh, other digital studio and what you could be able also to do by yourself with a, with a Sphere tool. I will come later on the tool. On this SNCF uh, environment that you can click on uh, on a point of interest and they say, okay, be careful here. There is a tunnel. You can, um, you can have a risk to fall down. Here, here, if you walk under this cabin, there can be... Um, a risk of uh, being crushed by the cabin, very nice. And, and you have uh, all different uh, different point of interest to sensibilize the people who's going to be working into this workshop, into this maintenance workshop. And that, well, that, that was a, a good experience that they could teach uh, to the learners, again, either in desktop in 360 or in VR with a headset. Another, uh, and that will be the last scenario that I will, uh, the last use case I will present you to the next slide. That is uh, a TV media, TF1. I'm sure the French people know about TF1. They are actually using ourselves. So this is not us who have done it. They, uh, uh, they decided to use Sphere to present all the program in VR. So you will be able to find this uh, this uh, VR experience in their website. It's uh, diving into the 360 uh, program into TF1. So if you go on the website, uh, the public web website of um, of this TV media, you'll find the, the resources, which is more uh, nice than seeing a screenshot of the pictures, but it was easy for me to do this presentation without a videos. And Having, um, okay, this is a TV media, so they have a great capacity of doing 360 shooting. And of course, they have uh, all the presenters, all the speakers who are pretty, uh, pretty uh, good <laughs> to, to do speaking in front of a 360 camera. And they are presenting the whole environment of the of the um, of this, this media, and they are presenting the different kind of program they are showing. So each speaker is presenting his own program. So it's kind of a virtual program tour. So it's uh, it's a nice way to have an overview of the program they are presenting. And having this 360, you can see the backstage, the front stage, and you can see all the environment they are facing every day to present this program. So I invite you to to watch it and uh, and to have a look on their website to have an, uh, a better view of their uh, of their presentation. Okay, so now uh, till now, if you have some question, please be free to ask me. So no question, I guess. I was totally clear. <laughs> If you have any questions, please press on the right hand button, which is at the bottom side uh, in the middle of your screen, or you can also write them um, in the public chat if you don't have a microphone. Don't be shy. Uh, there's one person who asked if, if you have the URL of the TF1 uh, use case, please, and if you could share it in the public chat. Yeah, okay, I'll do, I'll do that. Anybody else? Okay, um, uh, I'll be looking for the for the URL of uh, of the TV media. I will send it to you. Yes, thank you, Ludovic. Our soft is free until 30th of June. I was coming to that point. So let's switch to the next slide, and I will present you the software, so you can have a a view of the software as well. So. Uh, 
as I was telling you, so we have both a digital studio and a publisher, a tool publisher. So you have seen an overview of use case we have been producing for our customers, excepting the TFR who did uh, by themselves with our soft. And here are the soft that we have been created. And really, I, want, I just want to come back on this, uh, on the development, on the start of the development of this tool. It was really to work, um, we've been in the training for 20 years, so we wanted to have a, a tool who allows us to be um, pretty wide into the training. I mean, to have uh, all the options possible to do training scenario, deep training scenario, to be able to block environment, to do kind of escape game, to do storytelling. I mean, we just want to have the liberty of the imagination. So this is what we've done with Sphere. I mean, the limit of Sphere will be your imagination. And you will have to, yeah, to let your mind uh, go and uh, and write scenarios. And Sphere will help you just to, to like a puzzle, I mean, to, to, to concretize your scenario and to put in place uh, interaction uh, of your scenario. So easy, you can see on the, on the screen. So you have the 360, you load your resources. 360 can be pictures, videos, or 3D. I will come a bit later on the 3D. You will enrich with images, with different media. We also offer an online library with pictures, pictos, assets, and a large library also in 3D scene and 3D uh, modeling objects. And then you to life. So this is where the training scenario is, uh, is coming. So you bring to life with, uh, with the enriched media, with the triggers, with all the interactivity you want to put on your, on your scenario and with uh, using the timeline the, the timeline so you can really have different opportunities to um yeah to bring to life your scenario and to have different possibility from your resources 360 and from your um, media enriched and then you run so you you play you can deploy it's a web vr solution so you can play in any brother and uh you can play you know of course in 360 in desktop and on your smartphone, tablets, and on VR headsets. Uh, when we put mobile VR with the cardboard, so it's, a, let's say, the low-cost uh, solution, but it can be played in, uh, in VR headset, like a Rift, uh, HTC. You really are able to launch your uh, experience you have been created with Sphere into um, any brother. If we go to the next, uh, to the next slide. Uh, thank you. So the next uh, sphere characteristic will be into uh, the, the sharing. So as we opt for a web VR solution, it's an easy sharing experience. So you can share easily, again, through desktop, VR, tablets, and uh, smartphone. Uh, this, uh, how do you say, the, 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 the sphere is available today for uh for free <laughs> so thank you Ludwig, for uh, for adding this well, regarding the 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 lockdown context we are uh, facing today we decided to replay a mooc so uh, mooc the massive online open courses that we did we had um, a partnership with uh, we are based in lyon and we had a partnership with the university from lyon and we deploy we launched a mooc last year uh, in may and we decided with this uh, this lockdown situation to play it again so you can replay the mooc so it's it's for free you can uh, you just go on the on the fed mooc uh, platform and you can find all the innovation uh pedagogy i mean the 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 new way to work into the immersive learning and uh and joining this uh this mooc we allow you to to use the sphere license for free so it's the premium license that means that the um, you can you can create your content you can export it and you can play in your uh vr headset we also have some uh, um, as I said, we have a library which is pretty rich into photo and videos and 3D, and that helps you to create also a scenario and to to see how the the the, the Sphere tool is easy to use and to produce content. So be my guest, go on the website. It's uh, SphereApp.io. Put it on um, also on the chat. So if you go on SphereApp.io you will have uh you you will have to um download for free and you can uh, mix it with a mooc 
uh, the MOOC is only in French, so it's only for French-speaking people to follow the MOOC, but the Sphere app, um, the Sphere tool, sorry, is in English and in French, so you can both use it uh, until June, so the end of June, so you still have, uh, you still have time for that. If we can skip to the night, uh, Lunmila, so um, it's just to coming back on, uh, on the immersive learning. So it's just to make a focus on the immersive learning, saying that with the, the immersive and with the 360 and the VR, you really engage your learner and you really, um, yeah, you can use in uh, remote, in VR, in, uh, in 360 on desktop, like an e-learning model, but you can use in face-to-face. -face. I mean, just if you remember the, the Air France use case, it's really using a face-to-face -face and try to teach people from either a real environment or from a 3D environment to get the process correct and to do the exercise correctly and to, um, yeah, to help the people to uh, get the knowledge of, uh, of uh, this exercise. So it's much more faster and efficient to, uh, for the assimilation when you go through immersive learning. If we go to the next one, and that will be for the people who's working into education for the next slide, it's the XR education program. So you will find it on again on the website. It's um, thank you, Francois, for putting the the link of the FL. And uh, the the XR education program is also on the uh, our website if you go on the uh, offer you will have the, the proper offer for the for the the license and for the education program and on the, this education program we um we offer a free license for the class for example we have a convention okay just uh, we have the free license until end of june so this is one thing let's go to july july you are a university or high or, or um or a school and you, you you test the soft and you say okay this is great i want to put it uh, to to implement the soft into my university or to my school, you will, uh, you can, you can get to me. I mean, you can get in touch with me, and you will have a convention signed for a year. You will have a specific price for education, of course, and then you will have, um, we will supply for free for the whole class um, a free license for a year for your students. We decided to help the education with uh, with this tool because we think for the student project, for uh, even we are working with uh, with a professional uh, high school, and when they go and do some internship into companies and they have to do a report, it's much more efficient to report in VR than having a PowerPoint that I'm a <laughs> that is more. Um, yeah, classical, traditional, and a bit um, old-fashioned way. So, if uh, we we work all the, already with uh, with this professional school and with university, they invest in cameras 360 and they do their own content and they push. I mean, they invite their students to process with the um, the creation of uh, immersive content. So they have to think of the scenario, they have to think of the shooting, they have to think of many things, and they help a lot for the um, for the for the for the education process and education program so again be my guest go on the website spheerapp.io and you will find the license and you will have all the the info on the education program and i uh i just put my email address and if you want you you will be able uh, to get in touch with me i will be happy to answer also your question or to um typing at the same time um talking so uh, sorry here are my email address so if we can uh, skip to the next slide and I'm almost finished I just wanted to um, to make a focus on the 3d so you see that we've been modeling 3d for our France for ABB for different uh, different people in the 3d we've been also dealing with uh, a strong partnership with uh, SolidWorks. Uh, I don't know if some people are um, uh, know SolidWorks, so it's uh, it's one of the major 3D modeling tool developed by Data System. And uh, we were talking about um, about this partnership when we uh, almost uh, launched the the Sphere 
to, in uh, 2017. So it's been three years that we have this uh, partnership with, uh, with Dassault System. And having this partnership came from the GLTF file format. So I'm sure people who's working in the 3D environment will know about it. So the, the use of the GLT file format is a universal 3D file format, which has been uh, launched by Kronos Group. And um, we wanted to work in uh, hand in hand with, uh, with SolidWorks and Visualize, which is another tool of the uh, system, to have a workflow easy. I mean, this is to, of course, to promote the SolidWorks and Visualize 3D modeling, but also to have all the exports in GLTF. But th this is not only SolidWorks and Visualize. As long as you can export in GLTF, you can import into our soft, into Sphere. So, um, the background of Sphere is really coming from 3D, so it's um, for the people working on 3D, it's really interesting to test the, the sub because the, 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 um, the engine motor of uh, Sphere is pretty strong into the 3D environment. And uh, you can use the animation that you have in created into the modeling through SOLIDWORKS or Visualize, and you can put animation into the Sphere tool. You can also create more animation into the tool, into Sphere. And uh, and again, I mean, you can uh, you can do this training scenario. I mean, I'm not going to come back on this uh, discussion, but it's really you have many functionality into the soft. You have many possibility to uh, use what is existing into the 3D. So all the use of the CAD designer. I mean, um, I, we are in contact with uh, with Office Design, and I don't know if you heard. I didn't put this use case, but we are in a close partnership with uh, the IFPEN and EFP. So IFPEN, it's, um, it's an, a public institute research for all the environment of, um, of oil, of new development and new, um, new energy. And they've been working with SOLIDWORKS modeling and uh, as it is the design office, they usually work on modeling but it's stick to the design of it. I don't share it with other departments. Using uh, Sphere, they can still use what they have been modeling. They can share it into a VR environment through a 3D scene. And they can share with the marketing, with the communication, with the training, with the sales. I mean, what they are modeling in 3D, they can share it with all these kind of diff uh, all these different departments um, to to have a, a better uh, appropriation of the of this uh, this new brevet and this new modeling, and I can share it to the to to to, to more people. It's a web VR solution again, so it's easy it's easy to deploy to people. Uh, I think I've, if we go to the next uh, slide, Lumila, I think this is what I'm just uh, said. So it was about um, about sharing what you have been uh, doing with the 3D designing with the other department like marketing, sales training and maintenance. So really it's, um, it's a wide tool. I mean, you offer many, many possibility to do training scenario, to integrate 3D modeling from GLTF file format and to have the opportunity to share it widely. So I think I'm, done with my presentation. I hope I, I was not too long and I was pretty clear with everything. And uh, and I mean, today we have, uh, we work, as I said, as a digital studio with uh, with large corporation. And we have, uh, thank you, Ludovic. <laughs> And we have um, we have many large corporations using the soft. I mean, Air France is today using the soft. We have ABB using the soft. We have EDF using the soft. We have major university using the soft. I mean, I'm not going to make a list of all the companies using the soft, but um, the yeah, the possibility it's really deep. So go and dive into the soft and uh, and be my guest if I have. Uh, if I can help you, if I can answer your questions, um, I'll be very, very happy. <laughs> so, Ludmila, um, thank you very much for, for your help and for showing all my presentation. Thank if you for, you, yeah. go ahead, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, sorry. I was gonna say thank you for your wonderful presentation and for the audience. Um, if you have any questions to Severin, 
please uh, raise your hand. By doing that, you could have to press on the right hand button that is in the bottom middle side of your screen. If you don't have a mic, you can always uh, write it in the public chat and I will read the question. Thank you very much again, everyone. It's wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and I can see that Francois, thank you Francois for your help, put all the, the link on the on the chat so you will find the, the, the link for the MOOC, for the TV media, TF1 and for our website as well. So you have everything um, and we met Fidenet, uh, thank you <laughs> Frédéric. Uh, indeed, we, we met at Optitech at Montpellier and, uh, and the, the interface is, re is really, I mean, um, really easy to use. So it's, um, I mean, you'll be, you be convinced when once you, you try it, it's, um, I don't have more words than saying that we wanted to, we are the first customer of the tool actually, because we are a digital studio, so we are using every day and uh, we are making the soft evolve to our instructional designer, which are pretty demanding, and they want to industrial, industrialize their production. So that means that they want to go faster into the production. And they want to uh, to help people, I mean, to help the people who will do uh, the, um, the content to have the correct functionality and to save time and uh, money. <laughs> okay, so uh, it's 12.30, enjoy your meal. And uh, and if you want to have a chat with me, I mean you can catch me on the on the swap card on the on the um, on the platform, and I'll be happy to to have a discussion with you following this presentation. Uh, Frédéric, you're asking for presentation. Uh, thanks, Elena. Could you give example of marketing and sales use? Well, for marketing, for example, we've done some visiting of um, of uh, in, in the industrial site, and they use it to show uh, the production and how um, how uh, uh, how successful was the production of the of the factory, and they show it during a fair. So it was uh, an industrial company. No, so, I mean I can name it. It's uh, it's Vinci, and we uh, we did. Um, uh, a, a a VR tour of the, their industry, and they could use it to present their industry to their customers during a, a trade show, and they could showcase their uh, VR uh, industry tour for marketing. For marketing as well, uh, the ABB that I show you was destined to the sales force, but also for the marketing people, and it was to promote the uh, the catalog of the product from ABB. And it was to have a, a 3D scene and 3D environment and to push the the product and to ease the the, um, the knowledge of the staffers and the marketers to know better about the, the, the product of um, uh, ABB. I hope, thank you for your uh, your chat. Great to have all the people. Uh, this room and it's amazing and thank you Laval for organizing this because it's uh, really an amazing uh, time we are living since yesterday. Thank you very much for being here with us and for your presentation and for a wonderful talk that I see that everybody appreciates in the audience. Great. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much and uh, stay home, stay safe. I don't have a gesture, you can see me, but uh, no, I'm not going to raise my hand, <laughs> but stay home and uh, and hope to meet you in real uh, next year at uh, at Laval. We're done for the, for the presentations for this morning. Uh, we'll be back this afternoon with more. Uh, please come back and uh, in the meantime, enjoy the break. It's lunchtime for you, or if not, uh, see you later. Thank you.